E with Joe. Hello and welcome to this 10th episode of F E with Joe. Fire education with me, Joanna. The 10th episode. Doesn't time fly when you are doing something you are good at. This episode, I share with you the book launch for the second edition of the children's fire safety book, Jez's Lucky Day. As ever, you are encouraged to cut in and hear the wonderful story of the journey of Jez from the authors and practitioners who use it and a young woman who used the book as a child in her fire safety work. Again, as we say in Wales, enjoy all. And so let's begin. So, hello, Burada, a chroiso canest ichi gid. Hello, good morning, and a warm welcome to you all. What a pleasure to be your host for the book launch that celebrates the second edition of Jez's Lucky Day. For those of you that don't know me, I worked in the field of children and teenagers who set fires for 18 years, and that includes running my own company called Fabtech in this field, which is officially eight years old today. So it feels a really exciting time to be on screen with you all. For those of you joining us from overseas, you will have heard me speak Welsh in my first introduction. So Welsh is the official language of Wales alongside English and Wales is the country where Jez's lucky day is set and more specifically the South Wales Valleys which is where I'm from. So that's where my accent proudly hails. To honour the origin and settings of the book, I'm really delighted to welcome Amanda Venables from North Wales Fire and Rescue Service. Amanda is an arson reduction officer and a Welsh speaker, and she has fabulously agreed to be our translator for this event. So if anybody wants to ask a question through the medium of Welsh, Amanda can do that for you. And I would really encourage you to do that wherever you want to, because it really is a beautiful language that we don't hear enough of. So Amanda, thank you ever so much for being our translator for the day. I wonder if you can give us a wave and say hello so that we can see where you are on the screen. So if you say hello, we should be able to see you, Amanda. Oh, have we lost? Ah, oh, there she is, Amanda. Amanda, can you unmute yourself just so then you come onto the screen? There you go, I'm Yay. muted. Bolida, good morning. Bolida, <laughs> sunny North Wales. Yes, see, it does happen. We'll put those stereotypes in the bin. We do have way, uh, sunshine in Wales, but you can't have wet without, you can't have green, sorry, without wet. So, okay, yeah, it does rain a little, but we also have sunshine. So, Burida and Diolch and Vaudi T, thank you to you, Amanda, for today and being our translator. So, alongside Amanda, on screen, we have a range of fire services represented from Wales and England. And indeed we have fire departments from the United States. So I couldn't be more excited that the uh, second edition of Jez's Lucky Day is going international like the first edition did. So the first edition of the book reached the shores of Australia and New Zealand. And so it's really good that again today we have representation from uh, other fire services beyond that of England and Wales and the UK alone. We are joined on screen, of course, also by Jez's creators. And that's the authors, Michelle Audi and Kate Strudwick, who I'll introduce formally shortly and we'll have 
from their words, the journey of jazz. We're also going to hear from three different fire service practitioners who represent Mid and West Wales Fire and Rescue Service, Surrey Fire and Rescue Service, and Hampshire and Isle of Wight Fire and Rescue Service, who are going to talk to us about how they use the book in their work, whether that's face to face or online working, as so many of us have now had to do in this last year and a half. And finally, we will hear from a young woman who was introduced to the book as a child in her fire safety sessions. So what an enriching two hours ahead we are going to have. And I'm sure the time will fly, but I will also ensure we still have a 10 minute comfort break within the time on screen together. Also sending her best wishes for today's event is award-winning author, and that's an often overused statement, isn't, isn't it? Award-winning, but truly, we have the best wishes for today's event from award-winning author and educator, Tamsin Winter, who sends her apologies and can't be here because she has a date clash for an event of her own books. Because those of you that have trained with me will have heard me recommend a number of times the books of Tamsin Winter. So we have Being Miss Nobody, and we have Jemima Small versus the universe. Now, ordinarily, it would be terribly, terribly bad practice and poor etiquette to recommend the books of someone else during another author's book launch. Unless you are the author or you've organised the event, you don't really get to talk about anybody else's books. But on this occasion, we are making an exception because we are thrilled. And when I say we, that's Michelle, Kate, illustrator Jason Hodges and I, we are thrilled that Tamsin has endorsed the second edition of the book. In her words, as it will now feature on the back cover, she says this important book should be in every primary school. Well, having read Tamsin's books that are aimed at young adults, then her books should be in every secondary school. Because when a writer can take subjects like selective mutism, online bullying, body image and fat shaming and turn them into books that are funny, warm and moving, then quite frankly, it's a must for our teenagers to be reading about these topics in an accessible way. And also that us as adults, supporting teenagers as they navigate through their adolescent years that we are equipped with conversations and ideas on how to support our children and young people because there is no doubt that reading being Miss Nobody allowed me to become a better practitioner because of paragraphs like this. When I got home I didn't want to speak to anyone so I called to mum that the bus had been late and I had, I had some reading to do in my room. I went straight upstairs before she saw me and looked in the mirror in my bedroom. My cheeks were flushed from walking so far in the cold and my eyes were red from crying. I stood there and thought about all the things people couldn't see on the outside but I could feel inside my heart how invisible they were to everyone. Just like all the words I wanted to say, but couldn't. And how many of us on screen, whether in schools, in fire services, and the different disciplines we have here today, how many of us in our work can learn those words, hear them and recognize too many teenagers and children we've probably worked with where they can't find the words and maybe it's setting fires that tells us something is wrong. So what a privilege for Tamsing to have endorsed Jez's lucky day but quite frankly how could she not because it's impossible not to be captivated by this spellbinding magical book and I use those words purposely because there is something enchanting about the story of a boy 
who goes to his local primary school, who lovingly crafts a dragon out of cardboard and egg boxes, and a school hamster that we follow through the story, and at one point eating chocolate biscuits, another point drawing a self-portrait, darling. So this book allows our children to gasp and giggle in equal measure as the story unfolds and presents a really powerful fire safety message, yet done in such a sensitive and gentle way that as the story unfolds, gradually the lucky day of Jez, the central character, unravels as he thinks about making his dragon breathe fire. And of course, Jez could never have imagined what would happen next. And so our children, as they read the story, make all those connections to the hamster, to Jez, getting into situations where something happens that you never, ever imagined. And then, of course, all that happens after that. So given that the book looks beautiful, is so cleverly written, can make you smile and wonder, is the hamster okay when the fire starts? It's no surprise that the first print run of the book sold out, hence our launch today of the second edition. And I'm a big believer of, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So breathe easy folks, because nothing has changed with the illustrations of the book. It remains as big and bold and beautiful as ever, and largely the text remains unchanged. But coming together, the four of us, Michelle, Kate, Jason and I, we thought, well, we have the opportunity here to revisit. Is this book that was first imagined in 1998 still relevant in 2021? Of course it is, because children connect to stories about children and animals. But we did identify there were two opportunities to really bring the story into the century and 2021 where we are now. So the first is, for those of you familiar with the book, the page where Jez is in the schoolyard with Grandpa. It's the end of the school day and Grandpa is waiting to collect Jez. And Grandpa reaches in his pocket to smoke his pipe because in 1998, legally, you could smoke on school grounds. Thank goodness for progress. And so we realised to bring the story into a current health and well-being message for children, we've changed the text that sends out a message against smoking. And the accompanying teaching notes for the book give ideas on other health conversations you could then start to have with the children as you talk about the book together. The other area we changed was the hamster is now officially female. We already had a powerful role model in Jez's mother, the single mother who's looking after her family. But we thought, hey, the cleverest character in the book needs to be female. The future is female. And might I suggest also that these two strong, clever, creative female characters might just be reflecting the two authors who brought us the story in the first place. And so it is my delight to formally introduce Michelle Oddy and Kate Strudwick. And I will talk a little about the work of Jason Hodges, the illustrator, who isn't here, but is absolutely part of this story. So Michelle Oddy, one half of the writing team taught in a number of primary schools across London before moving to work in the South Wales Valleys in 1992. Shortly afterwards, she met the second half of the writing duo, Kate Strudwick, at Welsh language evening classes where, in Michelle's words, they learned a great deal of useful vocabulary about housework. <laughs> Nothing like education classes to raise the aspirations of people. And they are my words, not Michelle's. And so um, Michelle and Kate, after meeting, went on to work together on several schools arts projects before being asked to collaborate on a fire safety project, which, of course, developed into Jez's Lucky Day. 
They met illustrator Jason Hodges at the first project meeting and the three quickly discovered they shared the same sense of humour as well as a love of tea and cake. Kate has worked in a range of arts-based roles, including the things you learn about people you've worked with for years, including <laughs> as a roadie for an opera orchestra, managing a Cajun rock band and working for the Arts Council of Wales. There's another book there, I reckon. Kate still runs arts projects and is now creative director of Valleys-based community arts organisation, Head for Arts. She is still proudly learning Welsh and was recently interviewed for BBC Radio Cymru, that's the Welsh language uh, BBC radio station serving Wales, about her work. And for Jason, the illustrator, who is an extraordinarily talented artist who spent many years disguised as a teacher. Living in a beautiful hidden away part of the South Wales Valleys, this inspired much of the artwork you see in the book. I grew up as a Valleys girl and Jason grew up as a Valley's boy, and we both share a deep and affectionate understanding of the way of life there, which for Jason is in every stroke of his illustrations and is what for me certainly makes the book so very special. And so Michelle, if I can start with you, please. Where did the inspiration for the story come from, including the fictional name of the village Aberglyn. <laughs> well, at the very first meeting that we had with um, the whole team of people, um, we, were, we were told at the end of the very first meeting to uh, go away and have a think. It's a bit like being in, you know, first year of secondary school. Go and have a think and <laughs> with some ideas. And I'm afraid I've been a goody two shoes all my life. I wish I could break rules, but I can't. <laughs> two months away. And the following meeting, we are all supposed to come back with, with ideas. And I have done one. I don't know if anybody can see my little um, piece here. Yes. And uh, when we got back to the meeting for the next time, the, the person who was presenting the meeting said, anybody got any ideas? And everybody went, mm -hmm. <laughs> And I was too scared to be Miss Goody Two Shoes, but eventually went, I, I have a little bit. <laughs> Um, and so it, that's how it sort of started. I mean, there were there were some things in my head that I, at that point, before we'd even started working, Kate and Jason and I, um, was that he wanted to be, I didn't want a naughty boy. Mm. He's, he's an ordinary kid, like most kids we've all worked with, who yes. just make the wrong decision at the wrong time or doesn't think of the consequences. And so we didn't want him to be like a really naughty boy, because who's going to identify with that? Brilliant. Um, having worked in schools for a, about 150 years, I realised <laughs> that most kids, uh, boys tend to only want to read a story that's got a boy character they can engage with. Mm -hmm. Girls couldn't care less if it's a platypus or a, or a girl or a boy or whatever. They'll engage with the story. And so I thought the boy was a, an important thing. And having worked, as I say, in, 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 with lots of refugee kids across when I was working in London, I wanted him to be, you know, sort of trendy. And I can remember saying to Jason when he, he was doodling some little sketches, he's got to have he's got to have a really cool hairstyle, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> he's sitting on the carpet. So you know, Jason was sort of playing like hairdresser with this little character, and he had the spiky, you know, the shavings at the back. And so from that point of view, that's that was me being goody two shoes. And then the people who are organising it, as often they do, went, okay, you three look like me candidates, you go away and create a story. So off we trundled, the three of us, and, and we spent a lot of time, Kate and I particularly, spread-eagled on my living room floor at home with bits of paper. And gradually, there were things that we felt were really important. Having worked in, in Welsh school, I was amazed to find that there were no storybooks with, with uh, featured Wales really. You could get books about Cardiff Castle or Carnarvon Castle, but nothing that features Wales as its as its um as its focus. So, and then we decided the valleys because as an out, I'm an outsider, as you can probably tell, 
I'm not a local yet. I've been here nearly 30 years, but I'm not quite there yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, as an outsider, I can remember the day I drove to Wales for my interview for Abba Bargoy's junior school in, in the Valleys. Uh, as I drove through the valley, because for people who don't come from around here, the valleys are a, a sort of parallel roads and valleys with, with all the little villages all strung out. And the only way to get from one side to the other, if you're a townie like me, is to drive to the end of the valley, across the main road at the top or the bottom, and back down the next valley. The, the locals are brave and they'll do the little thin roads that go from one to the other. I couldn't even begin to do that, I was too scared. But driving along these valleys, I actually stopped my car in a lay-by, and what, what I could see, which you'll see in the, in the vista of the book, is these little ribbons of houses that are clinging literally to the sides of the valleys, which are left over from the mine workings or the steelworks or whatever industry used to be here in the valleys. And I can just remember thinking, look at all these little houses, just ribbons and ribbons of these houses, which is what features in the book and what makes it the children then immediately identify. And the other thing that local people don't notice is that around the windows and the doors of these houses are these little brick sort of like um, crenellations, little, and the kids don't even notice it. And you, you say to them, you know, like, have you got this in your house? Well, I don't know. But it's <laughs> literally like walking through the valleys. And so the, the vista and all the, the things that you see in the pictures are literally where the children um, live so they can identify and Kate and I went and uh, incognito because I managed to persuade Bully uh, Kajol so a couple of teachers in in the school I was working in to trial the book and we just had big black and white sheets with no color and the, the script was all written in bits of acetate and stuck on with sellotape and the children knew it was a new book and they were going to help to see mm -hmm. whether it worked and they were stuck onto a board and this lovely teacher took them through it it, it, we decided it needed to have more than just a message about the fire. We wanted it to work in every setting. So it was the literacy hour for a big book. It was the Welsh culture. It was the language that we use, as well as the fire safety story. Because if they're not engaged, if they're not going to read it or remember it or anything. But when we tried it the first time, um, the teacher who was doing the story went through the usual thing about where it was set and all the rest of it. And the children, we never got beyond the first page, Kate. I'm sure you can remember the very first one we sat in because the children spent 25 minutes looking at the scene of Jesse's school saying, that's Tradiga. But no, no, <laughs> the Chinese chip shop is on the other side of the road. No, that's it, pop lotted. No, because the clock is in the wrong place. And we told them oh, well, it's a made up place, but they were absolutely convinced because it was so like, so nearly like, where they live but not quite like where they live and so to us that was absolutely crucially important and Kate was really clever in um she won't mind me calling her a nerd because she knows she is uh, <laughs> very nerdy about the names of things so a lot of the streets are named like wyvern which is an old type of dragon um so everything the street names and the Chinese chip shop and the tours are all named after they've all got a Welsh connection because we wanted wanted to make it sort of physically Welsh if you like um, so that the children would identify. And as for Abba Glynn, I won't tell you how many hours of my life I took <laughs> an atlas and a Welsh A to Z or whatever the equivalent is around here, uh, looking to see, because Abba means the mouth of, like a river. Bonzi yeah. is Abba Tawe, the, the, the mouth of the river Tawe. And Glynn, what's Glynn, Kate? Um, Hen. A valley or? Yeah. I don't know, anyway, whatever Glyn, I can't remember what it means, but I'm sure... Again, it's a sort of a valley, because you have, like, Glyn Eboy for Ebbo Vale. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so we wanted to make it something that people who weren't Welsh could say. It was no good putting something really complicated in there. Yeah. Like, um, Astrid Gunlice or something, because people would just not be able to say it, and it wouldn't roll with the story. So it had to be something pronounceable, but something clearly Welsh. Um, and so from there it went on, and the children... They, we, we went through it over and over again with the, with the kids in classes and they, until eventually they, we knew we got it when this one little boy said uh, he was sitting there for hours, he came from a family of eight children where social services were involved and he was sitting with his nose right up to the, the book and I said, are you, are you interested in those pictures? Because they didn't know that I had anything to do with it. They knew Kate from the arts but they didn't realise I'd, I'd had anything to do with it at all because my name wasn't there at the time and he said, I want to live in this book and you just think at that moment, ooh, I think 
I think we've got it. I think we've found the thing, you know. And the other thing that sticks in my mind is that we tried it with some older kids because we wanted them to try and write the story of the, we deliberately didn't put the story in of the dragon's tail where that lovely picture of the castle and the dragon and the teacher's holding it and the hamster's peeping over the top. <laughs> we didn't write a story because the older children went on to make their own little books of the story uh, of the dragon's tail, making it up as they went, you know, as their own version. And as, as, as we tried it with those children, and when they got to the page, again, this is Kate and I laying on the floor to be the reading time in the late evening, trying to get the impact of the hamster going, and then you turn and, and he's really done it. And I remember following a group of boys, because in Valley schools, you have to walk outside to go and find a canteen, you up through the playground and to the, the little hut at the top. And I followed this group of year six boys and their teacher had stopped on the page that the hamster's going, and <laughs> do you think he's gonna do it? These are 11 year old sort of, you know, roughy tuffy boys going, nah, no, nah, you won't do it, a chicken out, you won't do it. And to think that boys were so engaged in a story they just, Seen that they were actually talking, instead of talking about who won the football or the rugby or something, they were discussing whether they thought, you know, he would actually strike the match. And it, it, was, it was the detail that really engaged the three of us. And, and Jason was able to, you know, we could say, can we do whatever? And he'd make it happen. And I think the kids love a book with detail. Yes. We were keen on the language. We wanted um, the message to be there, but not like rammed down their throats. Yes. And the little hamster came from a sort of, Kate, Kate's one for fluffy animals, she'll tell you all about that. But, <laughs> but it's all about um, like the little Jiminy Cricket character. He's yes. He's there really. And as he gets bigger and bigger, I can guarantee you won't get beyond page four with a group of kids before they go back to the first page to try and see him. Cause he is in that first one, he's tiny. Yes. You can see where he is. Um, and then the vista, we stupidly imagined we could go on and write a whole fleet of these books about railway lines and reservoirs and stranger danger. And so we wanted to set a vista that we could use again and again. And Jason was, as a child, I'd loved the Rupert the Bear books, which I realized 50 to 60% of the people watching this are going, hmm. <laughs> um, but it was very, very uh, the thing when we were growing up. And he lived in, Nutwood, and at the beginning of every Rupert Bear annual, there would be a vista of where he lived, and all his adventures were going to take place within that vista. And so that's what inspired Jason to make that fabulous vista, which at the back, of course, is, is when the kids get to the last page and they see the fire and they see his house, they turn straight back to the front and try and find his house on that first vista. So I ramble You're absolutely you right. Know, all the points you asked me, but <laughs> oh no 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 no, that's perfect more than perfect and you anybody who hasn't read the book you're giving them all these little tasters of you know the hamster being found on every page the point in the book where it reaches jez is going to light the match and the hamster's there in horror and now we know this little group of 11 year olds are going he won't do it he will is just it elevates it to another level and so it's got me thinking the next time i read that book i'll ask that question do you think Jez is going to do it? Will they say, yeah, or oh, no, brilliant, brilliant. And to hear about the intricacy, as you say, the brickwork on the windows. And that's what the size of the book allows for. You know, it is literally a big book. And yet, understandably, many practitioners I work with will sometimes say, well, you know, it's large and it's not the easiest thing to fit in a bag. But what was the deliberate purposeful of, no, no, this will be a big book? Why that format? Well, at the time, um, in, in the, well, through the 90s, the late 90s, it was the Literacy Hour, uh, which was, um, was in the curriculum so for an hour every day every child had to be doing literacy and it used to be uh, it was always done with big books and, and they brought up lots and lots of stories and big books in that format so it could go at the front of the class and could be put on a stand and the teacher would then follow a, a format for going through the book and every day you do the same book every morning for the hour but looking at something different you might be looking right. at the language one day you might be looking at adjectives you you know you would it would be interactive for example there's a lovely bit in the book where um he's walking up the street uh, the, at the end of the picture when he's done it and they're standing at the front and all the valley's people as valley's people know have all got 
you know, all standing outside having a look, you know, and having a cleck, I think is the word. Isn't it? <laughs> Yes. And uh, we, we actually introduced the idea of speech bubbles on post-its because we said, what do you think these people are saying? And they were going, you see, we knew that family was trouble, you know. But Brilliant. You know, put, get the kids to do, and then from that, you can introduce speech marks. Once they've written in a bubble, then you teach them how to use speech marks. So we wanted the, we wanted it to be used rather yeah. than just, we, we loved the visits from the fire safety officers who used to visit each a group maybe once a year if, if, because they were so busy and often they come and get called away again you know so they have but the children love their visit but if the book was only going to be used once mm. in a blue moon to us we we three of us felt that it was it was a wasted opportunity and if we could yes. make sure that it was used so you know in, in the school i worked in it was used by every class at least once a year as part of a literacy so the size is important so that the children sit in the back can see they'll sit on the carpet in front of you just in fact if you look at the page where jez's teacher is doing it that is it that is what you Brilliant. do you the teachers in front of you with the book and you go through a certain routine you look at the cover what do you think it's about you flip it over what does the blurb say let's have a look inside who's the author what does illustrator mean all of that sort of stuff about books in general but Brilliant. with jez's book the detail really if you think about how children like where's Wally, you know, mm. look, <laughs> looking for things. And I mean, some of them can sit there and say, you know, there's a snail crawling up the yeah. outside. <laughs> you just think, that's amazing. It, it's, it is. It's, that's it is. Instantly and to want to read on. And, um, and the different voices and, and, and yes. are both completely nerdy about language and have it used properly and introducing different words. And we deliberately included some Valley's words like grand chef. Yes. Yes. I have no idea what that was. On my first day in Wales in the school, one of the children said, how do you spell Grancher? <laughs> I told you, <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> yes. it? How do you spell it? <laughs> That's it. And you've raised a really important, uh, another really important, well, lots of important points there, Michelle. I'll bring in Kate shortly. But this whole idea, it is big because it can be the visual in the classroom. So we think straight away, well, this is for general prevention fire safety messages. And I love your point of why do we keep these messages for the one day a year when the fire service turns up? Why can't they be on the bookshelves, readily accessible as a lovely story? But of course, it gives us these messages all the time. And then when I think of how I use it in my work, where I am meant to be one-to-one -one working with a child but invariably I'm in someone's home and there's loads of children because they think we are the visiting circus have turned up who are you you're new and novel what's in your bag and then you open this big book and the children literally can pour on it like you when you created it you're on the floor and they point into things and picking up things and long live the nerds around language because it really matters and I'm often asked to comment on different fire safety books the fire services put together and actually it's a real art to writing a fire safety book because you've got to be careful of all the subtle messages that children will take from an image or a sentence so well as we know long live nerds and geeks especially in the fire safety world they really matter Michelle thank you so much I have to come to Kate because of course <laughs> Michelle has indeed said that it was Kate who brought the hamster so tell us about the hamster kate where did the idea come from that hidden in every page would be this hamster well we were one of, we, when we were writing this book I, I saw it as a series of challenges we sort of had to solve and obviously one of the biggest ones was engagement and mm -hmm. we, um, setting that whole context of Aberglen um and trying to put in as many elements where the children would feel really connected to the story uh, was very important to us. Um, so there was, we were also trying to, 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 to make it feel like a, like a school. And at some point we sort of talked about, well, he could take the school hamster home as being one of his lucky things that happens that day. And of course, <laughs> once we said hamster, <laughs> the cog started turning, we thought, well, we could we could we could use this. There's all sorts of other things we could do with this hamster, and then and of course uh, Jason loved that idea because it gave him you know it really um, appealed to him, seeing how we could integrate this little creature into uh, all the illustrations. 
But as um, Michel said about the idea was that he, he was also this um, conscience that um, when we were trying to work out what was going on in the picture, actually it's always useful to see what is the hamster doing um, and what, what what are the messages coming from the hamster, who, as you say, is the most sensible person in the book. <laughs> <laughs> um, Absolutely. So, so that was one of the challenges and the, and the hamster was one of the solutions to one of the challenges. Um, Brilliant. There were other challenges in the book. The biggest challenge is how do you get a nice child to start a fire? Mm, very good, very good. <laughs> and and also we had to be obviously mindful that what we were doing was not encouraging children to experiment. Yes. And um, so that we did a lot of research on fires. And in fact, um, I mean, uh, Jason used to astonish, astonish us because he, 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 you know, he went to obviously work closely with the local fire service and uh, they set some fires so he could observe them in great detail. And so he knew exactly what, you know, how the wind affected things. Wow. How, so um, well, how different materials burnt, what sort of smoke they produce. Um, and I wow. think one of the things that people have always come back to us and said about how scarily realistic the fires are, that is because there was an incredible amount of research. And I have to say, you think we're nerds. Jason <laughs> built those dragons and he burnt them. <laughs> wow. But you can see the detail in the book, the page where the fire takes hold in his room, the way the paper falls. And like you say, the different colours and where you can only get that level of attention to detail because, all right, I feel this now needs to come with a fire safety warning. Don't try this at home, kids. But there was Jason constructing dragons out of cardboard, setting them alight to see exactly how they burned to give that level of detail. And so we come into the authenticity of the book, the integrity. And I get the impression that you had a lot of fun the three of you, hard, hard work, but a lot of fun. Do you think we that did, we makes did. the book so warm? Yes, we did have a lot of fun, but we, we knew that we were all, also had uh, a, a serious task to do. Mm, and yes. uh, say, there were these challenges and trying to find a way that was um, believable mm. and engaging. Um, and um, we, we got very, very fond of Jez as a character. And we'd say, oh, no, Jez wouldn't do that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, I think one of the first things that Michelle said was that how important it was that Jez was this likeable child. Yes. Uh, we wanted him to be a, ch a child that, that, that people, that you know, youngsters could identify with. Mm. And um, also the fact that even, you know, nice people do very stupid things and, uh, and, and they can have really serious consequences. Um, mm. So, and, and that, 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 nothing's irredeemable that you know and, and i think in, in the context that you're using the book now joanna the fact that that children can learn from their mistakes they can move on from it yes. um um it's a very the, the the ending always makes us very sort of sad that poor that poor little boy sitting there with a blanket around him mm -hmm. when he's got he he's ruined his house he's frightened his sister he's nearly killed his hamster you know everything it, 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 and he thought it was such a good day. Yes. And then he's got to think, what will happen when I go back to school? You know, all 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 these things. It's it, it's. But we 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 think you know we try and set it up so that. You no, know, it's a warm school. It's a it's a it's, yeah. a, it's a loving family. He'll yes. get over it. Yeah. Um, and and in fact, everyone was saying at the end of this. You know, thank goodness everyone's all right. You know, yes. it could have been a lot worse. And um. We know that in his head, all these things are going through his head. And um, so, but, he, but yeah, I think our relationship to Jez was really important. Um, and that, that's, I think, you know, just the, the number of conversations that Jason and, and Michelle and I had about this child, what we would do, what would inspire him. Why would he set a, a room on fire? Mm. Um, and... That became, at the, at, when we first started writing the book, that was a really big sticking point. And we had several sort of scenarios. And that is why Grandpa smokes a pipe. And because we had to know where there were matches. We, we had to create a situation where there were matches. Yes. And we had to create it in a situation where the mum is quite keen to make sure matches are out of sight. Mm. 
Mm. Even though she does have the kitchen from hell. That was another good time. We <laughs> really enjoyed that. Moment. I'll come to that in a minute. But yeah, it's, it, it's that thing about what sort of context could there possibly be that would be acceptable also to our, our colleagues from the fire service mm. that we were not encouraging people to, to, to set fire to things, but that it could believably happen in that book. Yes. Yeah, the, the kitchen from hell. Yeah, that was, a, <laughs> that was another challenge and an opportunity. We had a double page spread, and we, we knew that um, that uh, the fire safety advice used to be all sorts of things. It wasn't just about not fire setting, not, not experimenting with matches. It used to be about general safety, and um, so it, really that was an exercise as to how many dreadful things we could cram into one kitchen, but still make it look like a believable working kitchen yes, that we might exactly. come across. Exactly. Um, and uh, yeah, that was that, was, that, that was really good. Oh, it was. <laughs> and they, but you're right, because why do so many people internationally get this book? It's in the South Wales Valleys, yet it has a universal appeal. And it's because of what you've talked about there. He is a boy who's just doing what kids do. We get stuff wrong and how gentle that is. And it's so extraordinary, Kate, that when you were saying, you know, the hamster nearly dies, he nearly harms his sister. You almost think this is going to come with a certificate 18 morning soon that it's done with a gentleness and a warmth that is believable and remains manageable that a child reading it who's done the same isn't shamed or left with guilt but recognizes yes we can all get things wrong uh, well, also, parents, sorry. also i think that because we created this very warm and protective environment we were able to go really scary with the, with, with the images of the fire mm -hmm. and um, I think had we not sort of set that scene, it could have been that horror story. <laughs> Yes, you're right, you're right. And it's interesting that some children will do that or look away from the book, that classic, what we know the body does when it doesn't want to see or hear something, it will look away and we know then learning can't happen. But in this book, you're right, it's in that environment of, no, there is this sense it will be okay and you're there as a teacher at the front or next to them in their home or wherever you're working, that allows this to be safe and hence that really difficult balance balance of you leave a powerful message yet it does no harm quite the contrary i had to say though there there was a moment we had a big discussion as to what happened to the hamster did he survive or not <laughs> and in the end we thought no we can't lose the hamster that yeah, would just no, be too couldn't. sad that would that would that would be far too sad <laughs> i agree i agree you pitch it absolutely right when the hamster turns up spoiler alert for anybody who hasn't read the book yet when the hamster turns up at the end in the firefighter's helmet with bloodshot eyes yeah there is this sigh of relief the kids are going there he is there he is oh now there she is there she, she is, is. There she is. Brilliant. exactly exactly <laughs> Exactly. Team, Kate and Michelle, thank you ever so much. Clearly, you're staying on screen for questions and to listen to everybody's contributions. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to move to it's Diana Harris, who is the safeguarding lead for Mid and West Wales Fire and Rescue Service. Because, of course, we are going to say it's fantastic. This book, go buy it and use it. But what really matters is that we have on screen practitioners who have used the book outside of the South Wales Valleys and have their own experience of why does this book from 1998 still stand today in 2021? So, Diana, if I may come to you now, folks, we are in the company of a true stalwart in this field because for over 20 years, Diana has worked in fire setting intervention for her fire service, now in the manager's role alongside a safeguarding lead. And so Diana, with that wealth of frontline experience, managerial experience, there must be many cases, I imagine, you can think about where you've used Jez, but I wonder if there's one that particularly stands out for you. Yes, definitely. Thank you, Joanna. Um, yeah, today I'm going to just talk about one little boy that particularly stands out after all these years, you know, some children, um, you still think about and this is one of them so um as with 
most fire services, the referral came in from the school. Um, so we gather background knowledge about the child and the family. Um, and I rang the mum to, to arrange to visit the house. Um, so when I was going through our form, finding out what, what's, I'm going to call him Johnny, what's, what's little Johnny's interests? Oh, he's, he's got no interest at all. He's, he's, he j except for lighting fires. I can't do anything with him. His behaviour is terrible. You're not going to be able to interact with him. He, you know, he, um, she actually called him the son of Satan. Um, so when, when I gathered all my information, I was actually feeling quite apprehensive visiting the family home because I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to go and see this little monster. Okay. Um, when I arrived, uh, sorry, part of the background information was that the family had suffered three house fires. Wow, gosh. Yeah. So when I arrived, there were eight children in the house. Um, I, I, walked, I was invited into the living room and sat on the edge of the settee because the dog took pride of place on the settee, big, huge dog. <laughs> And little Johnny was sitting in the corner, really quite quiet, not making eye contact. Um, I had one little girl wrapped around my neck with her arms wrapped around my neck and another little girl plopped herself on my lap. And dad just talking over everybody continually. Um, it was clear from with being within the house for the first five minutes, it was clear that the family weren't fire safe away at all. There were lighters everywhere, even though they had suffered three house fires. So um, it was absolutely chaos in the house with, with all of these children. So I, I always take a little bag of tricks with me so that I've got plenty of resources okay. to fall back on if something doesn't work. So in the end, I ended up getting on the floor and I got Jez's Lucky Day book out and all the children gathered around me, apart from Johnny. Johnny was still oh. sitting in the corner um, in the chair. So the children loved the book. They were, it, you know, they could relate to, to the pictures, as has already been said, um, with, the, with the scenes of the school. It was really useful. The kitchen scene with the dangers there was really useful not only for the children, but for the parents. As yes, well, because, definitely. Yeah, because, you know, we, I was saying to them, can you see any dangers like this in your house? Um, that type of thing. Um, it was it was quite a challenging referral to do to, because cool. of the chaos in the house and because the, because the parents weren't really, they needed the education as well yes. as the children. So anyway, at the end of the of the session, I packed all my things up and got ready to leave. And I asked it, would it be OK if I went to visit little Johnny in school? Because that, I felt that that would give us more chance yes. to interact um, and give him the attention that he needed. Yes. Because all the time I was there, he hadn't interacted at all. And as I got to the front door, so he came up to me and grabbed my arm. And he said, I've drawn you a picture. And he gave me the picture and it was him playing football. And it was a picture of a dragon. <gasps> oh, so, um, yeah, it was lovely, really lovely. Oh. So, so I said, I told him, you know, would it be OK if I come into the school to see you and we can talk more at school? Oh. So that's what I did. So I arranged um, to go into the school. And funny enough, he had taken in everything about that story and he asked he actually asked me if i'd bought the book you know could oh. we read the story again so that was really lovely and he did relate the hamster did play a big part and he could relate to his dog you know um oh. i sometimes feel that children have got more uh, affinity with their pets than they do with their family sometimes um yeah. So that was really, really good. Um, and at the end of the story, you know, when when you were saying about the 11 year olds, will they like, will they strike the match or won't they strike the match? I, I actually asked, what do you think is going to happen next? 
-hmm. and he knew that there was going to be a fire um and he said his, his toys are going to catch fire but yeah it, it it is a really good tool for engaging with children, either as a group or one to one, and even the parents, you know, um, the messages were all in there for the adults as well. Um, I liked what Michelle said and what Kate said about it being non threatening mm -hmm. and not making the child a naughty child, because I yes. felt with this case, he was being demonized by his mum, you know, with, with oh. what she was telling me. The, the background picture of this little boy was that he was a very naughty child um, and actually the son of Satan. But he really wasn't, <laughs> you know. No, he, he, was, he was a lovable little boy um, oh. and, and he stuck with me all these years. Well, Diana, and that's actually what I wanted to ask. Are you okay after sharing that story with us? Yeah, yeah, I'm okay, thanks. Yeah. Because doesn't this work hurt? Where in the job description is that for folks on screen as teachers, as fire service practitioners, that you'll have these children that come into your lives and you will always wonder about them, maybe still worry mm. about them? Because there you were, Diana, I'm just so glad he had that experience of you, a practitioner who wouldn't buy into this idea of him as the son of Satan. And what's mum's story that she's reached that point of a child that's, that's all she can see and say? And that there you were prepared to read a book and you've given us so much there, Diana. This could be a whole event in its own right how he took everything in, even though he seemed not to be listening. The picture, that tug of your arm, the other kids draping themselves around you, and then how you were so focused on him to say, can I come and see you in school? And then he asked you, have you got the book? Wow, Diana, what an impression you have left. And just like with Tamsin, how privileged we are that you also are one of the endorsers on this book for somebody who's done this for so long with such integrity and warmth. My goodness me, Diana, thank you ever so much indeed. What a privilege to have listened to you. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, my gosh. And so we thank Diana and we now move to Charlie. So I'm going to find Charlie on my screen. So bear with me one moment. There she is. Hello. So Charlie is the Firewise Manager for Surrey Fire and Rescue Service. Again, another colleague who's happily endorsed the new second edition for us. And so it's really fair to say, isn't it, that working in Surrey Fire and Rescue Service is not the setting of Jez's lucky day and when I put into a search engine yesterday as part of my preparation for this Surrey one of the frequently asked questions that came up was why is Surrey so posh <laughs> <laughs> and without ever wanting to speak ill of where I'm from we probably wouldn't describe the South Wales Valleys as posh yet you Charlie have often said to me just how a duck you do find Jez as a book. So tell us why is that so? For you, why is it adaptable? Thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me along today. It's really nice to speak amongst everyone else. Um, so when I joined Surrey, it was about 17 years ago, and <laughs> I started up as an education officer, and I got moved into the Firewise scheme um, with very little training. So to be honest, for the first few years, back in 2011 I muddled through and amongst my muddling through into my practice um, I wasn't a manager then I was actually a full-time practitioner I remember seeing this huge red book and I took one look at it, at it and to be honest with you all I just went we'll never be able to use that that won't go in everybody's firewise bags so I immediately <laughs> dismissed it because at that point we had about 30 firewise advisors most of whom are operational I thought there's no way they're going to carry that big book around with them. So it just sat there, slotted between our desks at the, at the headquarters office for, I have to say, it was probably about a year. And then at some point, my colleague, Hannah Evans, thank goodness, she pulled it out. She was struggling with the case and she thought, you know what, I'll just give it a go. So she got out this book and she came back to the office after and she was just full of beans. 
She was like, this is fantastic. The next time you go out, Charlie, let's use this together, which we did. And we've never looked back since. Mm-hmm. And what I learned from that is never judge a book by its huge red. Well, in this case, <laughs> I actually made a mistake. Holding, folks. So, but ever since that point, we've used it stacks in our practice at Surrey, particularly sort of myself and Hannah, because at that point we did the majority of the cases. And when I was asked to say today what I liked about the book, I honestly, I could pick so many different things. Um, it's a huge page turner. I almost have to hold the child back. Sometimes they're <laughs> desperate, you know, <laughs> desperate to turn the pages. But for me, it's it's a really varied resource. Um, I'm going to I'm not going to go into detail about cases, but the, the last time I used it literally was a few weeks ago. Um, it was the fourth visit we were doing with the little boy. The first three sessions we'd done online and the fourth one we were actually doing face to face in his garden with dad there. Really interesting little chat out of school at the age of seven years old. He's got ADD, oh, ADHD and he's on the autistic spectrum. Oh. So no surprise, bouncing around the garden jumping up and down on his skateboard he'd like you know trying to get his bike out so we got the big book out dad knew we were going to use it he sat on his skateboard and he, <laughs> as you know, he, he actually sat on his skateboard and listened <laughs> and we get we got out this big red book and we you know we said to him pretty early on so you know look out for the hamster oh. and the first time he saw the hamster it was hilarious the first <laughs> that's not a hamster that's a furry slug <laughs> everyone was having a stare at dad and I, I think him and dad's relationship's probably not been the best at times because um. obviously quite a challenging child but um oh that was it every time we saw the hamster we didn't give we didn't ask him to name it he'd named it the furry slug and <laughs> Ever more in my mind, every time I see the hamster now, I just think of this little boy oh. saying furry slug. Anyway, so we had lots of laughter with that. The book worked really well with him. Um, so he was just seven, which is actually I wouldn't have ever suggested, probably when I first saw that book of using it was such a young age, but he was such a bright little boy, like incredibly intelligent, that he just got it and really enjoyed the resource. Um Generally speaking, we tend to use it for key stage two, but one of the things, and I said about accessibility, it can go up to really quite a high age if that child has got the right special educational needs or the right kind of personality. I think the eldest child I've used it with is a 14 year old. Wow. So really wow. quite a span of ages. Amazing. I have to say the little boy that I used it with a couple of weeks ago, he's pretty much the youngest he was just seven um an older child I've used it with um this was quite recently as well it was last summer and again it was outdoors because we've done a lot of our work in the garden because of Mm. COVID um now this little boy will say little he was 11 he was finished year six but honestly he was getting close to six foot high <gasps> with it wow. I mean I'm quite small so he was looming over me wow and I remember just seeing him and and this was part of his issue everybody spoke to him like a much older child yes but actually he was a child with well he is a child with behavioral emotional social difficulties So how he presents himself visually and how he is mentally are two really different things. And he loved the book. As soon as he saw it, he was engaged straight away. We read it in the sunshine in the garden. And in the background, very sadly, was the burnt mattress and the windowsill from the fire that he'd set a couple of months before, still never been moved. Um, But he sat it and we could explore so much with that young person. There was endless talking points. We were going to work with him again um, as a follow-up visit at a fire station because he's had now about a year of not setting fire settings. Excellent, excellent. And we said we'd give him as a reward at the year point that he could actually come and visit a fire station. So the Jesuits worked really well with him. Charlie, amazing. Yeah, I mentioned about the accessibility of Jez. Well, Mel Owen is going to talk, I think, a little bit about virtual, but thank goodness for Mel during COVID, 
because she also alerted us in our regional group about using Jez's Lucky Day as an online resource. And we've also done that in Surrey and it's been really successful. So thanks, Mel. That's worked really well as well. So it translates very well online as much oh. as it does face to face. Um, Charlie, amazing. Just yeah, again, like with Diana, so much there we could explore for the rest of the day. Yeah. The importance of training. What happens if we don't get trained? We muddle through. Know your resources because they might just re work really well for you. And above all, how beautifully you said you pitch to the child's emotional level. Yeah. What's their understanding, of course, and their chronological age, but where are they? And how powerful to think of this big, literally physical boy almost being treated like a young man yet yeah. he has all these younger emotional needs absolutely stunning there's one thing i'd like you to do please for our overseas visitors will you yeah. just give the age for the key stages and the years that you talk about so yes yeah, key, so key stage two the age group i'd usually use it most with is about seven to eleven but that's just kind of how it fits in this country with the way the school so essentially that's junior school age so Brilliant. that's the most the age range however for us, we have so many of our young people and children have special educational needs that it varies drastically. Um, right. And what one last thing I, I said about what I wanted to say about Jez's lucky day and its accessibility, whether it's the age range, the size of the group, one to one or in a whole class, it's so versatile. But for me as well, and being from the fire service, it's really versatile for the type of fire they've set as well. Because I've used it on someone uh -huh. who's done really fairly, you know, I know it's wrong to say minor fire setting, but from someone who's set just one fire to someone who's actually quite a complex fire setter, someone who's set the fire in different locations and over a number of years. So it, it's a really useful if you're using it in fire setter intervention work. I find it's quite adaptable regardless Good. of what Great. the background of the fire setter is there's always something that's relatable to that case and something you can adapt to the book to the child that you're working with so brilliant thank you, Kate and michelle uh, very useful <laughs> hurrah wonderful and that is especially encouraging because again one of the conversations we had was well it's a match most of our children now will use lighters but yes you look for the commonalities you look for where it relates and charlie you've set us up beautifully for when we come back after the break where we will indeed hear from Melanie and then we'll hear from Jenny so thank you again Charlie and everyone who's spoken so far thank you folks on screen listening so patiently and attentively we'll now take our 10 minute comfort break I'll pause the recording by my clock it's 11 32 so i shall see you back on screen at 11 42 thank you everybody thank you very much indeed so folks welcome back and we know now we're going to hear from melanie owen the early education coordinator for hampshire and isle of wight fire and rescue service now mel's work indeed features in my book about children and teenagers who set fires some of the resources melanie uses in her work with teenagers for example are there in the chapter on working with teenagers funny that so if you're familiar with melanie's work anyway as has been said by Charlie, often very innovative, as this work demands us to be. So it's a real delight to welcome Melanie and to hear, well, yes, as Charlie has said, you've used during the pandemic Jez online. How have you turned this big book, this literal page turner, into something that can be used through a screen? Well, thank you very much. I think anybody that knows me, um, either from our regional um, group or I think one of my managers is online as well, um, knows that I was dragged kicking and screaming into the world of virtual delivery. Um, it wasn't going to work. Um, we're working with, you know, hard to reach families, hard to engage with children. It, it wasn't possibly going to work and, and I was not going to do it. 
Um, however, obviously, as time went on, it was it was very clear that, that we had to do something. So I looked at a lot of my resources and the one that I was, you know, pretty sure that wasn't going to work on online was reading stories. How can we possibly get that across on the screen? And it's a really big book. It wasn't <laughs> going to be physically possible to to read it on a screen. Um, so, yeah, I had to do quite a bit of thinking and you know as as you know with this work a lot of it is is it's very blue peter stuff isn't it you know we haven't got all singing or dancing we haven't got a lot of money to do resources so you have to get your blue peter head on so i kind of thought okay i think i can put this book into a powerpoint how am i going to do that um I'll still read the story, but I, I want something for the children to be able to look at. Yes. So here I am in my in my front bedroom, <laughs> my Jez's lucky day out on, on the table and with my iPhone standing <laughs> on my office chair <laughs> very precariously to get the right angles to take a picture of every single page of, of Jez's lucky day, which I managed to do without any injury. Um, a few scary moments, but I managed to do it, especially on the double page. You, <laughs> that double page, that was the one that gave me the stress. But yeah, did it. They put it all into um, a PowerPoint. So I emailed all the photos to myself because I'm, I'm not brilliant with technology. Do you know what I mean? There was probably a, a much easier way to do it, but I did it. So well done. all to myself, got this PowerPoint. Now, usually, um, when when I'm reading the story sort of face to face, I always start with, um, right, you know, we're going to read Jez's lucky day today. Um, what would be a lucky day for you? And we talk about, um, you know, they normally say going to the football or, or whatever and eating sweets and that kind of thing. And I discuss that, you know, my lucky day would be going to the beach and eating fish and chips out of mm. the paper. And that's kind of, you know, it's, it's an icebreaker, isn't Brilliant. it? Brilliant before we launch into the book so I'm kind of thinking well here we go so to make the powerpoint more interactive as well I can weave all the questioning into the powerpoint so my first page on the powerpoint is um you know what what would be a lucky day for you so I'm able to capture that young person their thoughts in a document as well so brilliant it, it makes it it makes it really good to to be able to capture their thoughts and and record them against their the the recording system that we use so i so i can you know capture everything that they've they've done so, so when are you live typing when you ask them yeah. what's your lucky day you would learn type up yeah. it comes on the screen for them to see football or fish and chips brilliant so it's yeah really so they they can see that page and they they can see what what i'm typing and obviously document is saving and and i re record that against their their records um, and obviously other questions are, are woven into that PowerPoint at different points as well to, to be able to capture their thoughts and their comprehension of, of what they've actually taken in. So, you know, for instance, we get to the, the double page spread with the kitchen and we, we've talked about, you know, what can you see here that could be dangerous? And, and we also talk about, you know, well, these are all things that we need, but you know, how could we make them safe? Brilliant, and brilliant. Be dangerous because they're not being used properly. So what can we do to make this safer? Um, and at that point, there's there's a slide where I record their thoughts there. So I will type in what, what they've found that, that could be dangerous. Brilliant. Um, and then obviously, yeah, we move through the book. A again, a comprehension question is, um, where, where did Jez find the matches? And then... Good what would you do if, if you found some matches brilliant, what could brilliant. you do and then um what did Jez do again we, we want to tell them that you know um people behave in a fire because they're scared and they don't always do what they should do so you know we've got our motto get out stay out call 999 so what did Jez do you know why do you think he did that what should you do so again that's reinforcing brilliant, brilliant. the messages that that we want to give um and then right at the very end, um, the last sort of comprehension recording piece is, OK, let's write a letter to Jez. What would you say to Jez if, if you could write him a letter? And again, I'm I'm typing and 
previously pre-covid i was asking all these questions but they they were worksheets um which was was just as as good so we write a letter to jez dear and it's you know it's usually dear jez don't play with matches and lighters which is <laughs> you know they're all the same but that's what you know that's the good thing but, you know i was saying the other day i had one and he was um dear jez don't play with matches and lighters bro <laughs> I kind of laughed at it, but I liked it because that's that's what what he said, and it's it's really important to capture, you know, in in their own language as well. Brilliant, their piece of work, and you, you've got to you've got to let them them go go with that, haven't you? With with wonderful. Them. But I still um, I'm back out face to face now. I've had Great. to be back out kicking and screaming. <laughs> I liked it in the end. Um, but I do take the book with me, um, but I still use the PowerPoint just because it, it's just so effective and uh, at recording those thoughts, you know, in a really timely way and easy. So then when I, when I get back to the office, I don't have to photocopy all the work yes. and things like that. It just goes against their record and it's 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 immediate. But there is so much to love about the story and one of the things I particularly like is I love the alliteration. Yeah. I That is my, my favourite bit. Oh, man. Rushes, Kerry yeah. cut the card and Wendy wipes the water away. And there's, there's always a smile on my face when I'm, when I'm saying that. And if I'm enjoying it, they're enjoying it, aren't they? And also it's, it's that opportunity to, to get a little bit of, because I do talk about alliteration and there's opportunities to, to get other learning in there and I think that's mm -hmm. important for us where our main job is there to talk about the fire safety and, and the fire setting however if we can discreetly get in a, a few sort of literacy things in into there as well why wouldn't we and yeah and now when I'm out with with them I've I've got my laptop I've got the book and I've got my little um little gadget that they can point red dots on the screen and point yeah. different things so yeah I've I loved using it face to face and and I and there still will be those opportunities to use it cool. because you know we are uh, that we're changing back now but there there are times where we're we kind of blend in um sometimes it might not be appropriate to to visit a young person we can we can have that different approach now so I will carry on using it with with my powerpoint in my front bedroom or when i'm face to face so. <laughs> oh well again as with diana and charlie this could be another whole training day all that you talked about there that's so relevant that what are our approaches now a blended approach our children and young people whether we like it or not live in online worlds as much as they do the real world and you're stepping in and offering both and if that isn't focused on how does this child communicate then I don't know what is and the fact that you're really capturing their words that you will type on screen so when Mel talks about recording not recording like I am doing now but recording by typing up and then that gets saved and can go into the file so Melly can remember what was gone before what has gone before present that possibly to the children in the future and mm. how amazing that someone from the fire service with all the authority Mel and you have we have in this work comes in and really listens and if you've written or said don't play with matches bro she ain't gonna correct it she's putting down what you said because it's your language and Mel wonderful there's a reason why Charlie talked about you as someone in your regional group who gives ideas why your resources have been used in my book and bring on the blue peter badges I <laughs> say long live the creativity of furry slags and kids that tell us don't play with matches bro because you are giving your children a voice where they can absolutely say what they think and if that isn't beautiful practice then quite frankly I don't know what is so thank you Mel and so we think about how we give the young people we work with a voice and it is always humbling to introduce the next person who's going to be speaking for us and with us so 
The young woman's name is Jenny Lee Martins. Some of you might be thinking, why do I know that name? Why does that seem familiar? So you may have seen Jenny speak at a 2017 conference on fire setting behaviour in central London. You might recognise her as the teenager who role models in my role plays for the foundation training I deliver that went face to face. She acts as the teenager that people I've trained over the course now get to work with and practice on without wanting her to seem like she's a laboratory animal, but she's an outstanding actor for us and really makes the course come alive for her work and her input. And of course, you may recognise her name because she is a whole chapter in my book which was dedicated to the fire safety work together we did because she is so truly inspirational and I had the privilege to know Jenny now nearly 10 years ago because at age 13 she was setting fires at home so Jenny I need you to put your camera on for me here she is looking fabulous as ever so jenny we'll take our time we'll go with the flow as suits you but all of us are delighted to be learning from you so you've heard it said a lot this morning it's set in south wales it's a valley's book for valley's children <laughs> yet there you were in inner city london in a flat and i'm coming along with a book for children that are usually much younger and it's all about a boy in South Wales. So given that there you were 13, clever, sharp as a button, what made it okay that we could read together a fire safety book for much younger children? Um, sorry, did you mean relatable like to me or just relatable in general? For you. So we can think more generally later, but for you, not really knowing me, see the big book that's for kids and you're a teenager, why was it all right for us to read that together? Well, the book was really gentle. Uh, it kind of eases you in. Um, and it started off very light for me and um, hundred percent the hamster, <laughs> hundred percent the hamster, because I, I had a cat at the time, so I was constantly relating the hamster back to me, and it was just, it wasn't intimidating for me to kind of be read the book, and it, I don't know, it was very educational for me as well, and it just, it sent the right message to me, and it didn't kind of scare me off. It kind of brought me in. It was constantly bringing me in throughout all the pages. Um, and it was it was great. It was great for my age at the time and it was probably great for me younger and it's still great for me now. It was just <laughs> very educational, no matter what age I was, so yeah. And that's actually quite something to listen to. And maybe this is my stereotype, but I wouldn't expect typically a teenager to say, oh, I like the book because it was educational. It usually say to a teenager, do you want to read this educational book? Unless it's a subject they're really interested in, they're going to go, uh, no, thanks. And yet here you are saying at your age of 13, it felt relevant. It could have been relevant younger. And you're even saying, it could be relevant now. So what makes it for you be like that? What, be educational? Be your... Yeah, just at, at the different ages you've talked about that this is all right. I could read this. Well, it was it's good. I don't know. It teach it. I think it reteaches adults and it also teaches kids with every little bit of the book. So it starts off teaching kids like, well, actually reminding kids, you know, in school, like, you know, you do art class and you do English class and it connects you there. And then it goes on to teach you about like plugs and the dangers in the kitchen, you know? And I think it reminds adults as they're reading it to the kids, you know, remember to turn off the plugs or remember to unplug them or remember, don't leave this reachable for the kid, like the matches in the granddad's coat. 
It's like, mm. if the kid can reach it, the kid's gonna grab it. <laughs> um, so I think that's where it, it connects to each age, you know? Um, and then, yeah. <laughs> and that's nice to hear because it's echoing what Kate said that they almost had in mind two audiences at one point that well where's the messages for parents here and I will forever now think of it as the kitchen of hell having heard <laughs> Kate talk about it in that way that yes the, and that's the craft of the book that you can read it once and you'll get the story but then you'll notice well there's fire alarms on the walls in the school so it allows you to ask somebody when did you last have a practice in school when was your last fire drill do you ever practice at home what to do how would you get out in a fire so I'm glad that because that certainly wasn't my thought when we were working together one-on-one -on -one. your mother didn't come into all our sessions yet you've picked up on things that you could see would be messages for others so there's something there about it's not only the kids to learn and get right we all get stuff wrong including the mom in the book who yeah the kitchen isn't far from it the safest it could be but again is realistic how many of us have gone into kitchen that there's stuff we haven't unplugged uh, I say that obviously with all the caveats of now I am completely and utterly fire safe in my home and in my work. So you talked about the hamster, absolutely. Was there anything else that made the book enjoyable? Um, sorry, I've got my uh, notes here so I can like... That's all right, that's okay. Uh, I, I, think I, I think I might have already said it. I enjoyed the interactiveness of it. Um, I was actually uh, saying to you this morning about how I was re-watching your YouTube video when you read it out to us and um, when when they go into the kitchen you circle like all the problems and it's like when you read that to a kid you'd ask them okay so what are all the dangers in this room what are all the dangers here um, when he sets fire to the room and all the smoke's going up it's like okay how does he get out of there safely so when I think that would it's I enjoyed that you know even now I enjoyed it because I was while I was watching the video I was like oh there 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 um so I enjoyed that interactiveness of it right um, and how teaching it uh how easy it was to kind of teach a kid when they're reading it so like when you you see the sort of thought process of him when he wants to kind of make the fire with the dragon yes. and you see the thought process of it and it's like um I think as a kid you'd see that and you'd kind of be like oh that's a really good idea when he's talking about the matches and then in the book it's like so is this a good idea no it's not a good idea <laughs> and then, you know you learn from that you learn from his mistake so I liked that that was quite enjoyable it, it wasn't it wasn't like this is bad mm. this is not good. You don't do this it was like uh oh don't do this sort of thing I really right. <laughs> And I think there's a danger because as adults in emergency services, we know the dangers, the absolute consequences that can happen. So often we want to come in and make it very black and white, right, do this, don't do that. And there's a time and place for clear instruction and fire safety advice, of course. But I'm so glad that for you, it was, no, you will start to ask yourself these questions. Oh, actually, no, that isn't such a good idea. It starts off good, then it doesn't become a better idea rather than be told, lectured through a book and again that resonates very much with Kate and what she said about you want it to be enjoyable not just oh well that's that lecture over and done with exactly and that's why I like at the beginning he's in the school and he's in his classes because you see him having fun with his friends and the sort of excitement of taking the hamster home and then <laughs> you also have the hamster you know holding the wing above his head while he's <laughs> in the in the art class and I just oh and the self-portrait as well so <laughs> yeah. I enjoyed that so much and then and then it goes into the important stuff you know yes good so you're hooked 
And that's exactly. the word we often use in our work. How do we get somebody interested? What's the hook for someone yeah. to want to sit with me for an hour or change something that they do? And that's lovely how you described it there, that, yeah, you're getting hooked in, that then you want a certain outcome or not. And how striking that the hamster for you, you could relate it back to your cat. And when Kate talked about, you know, the attachments, or sorry, Michelle, talked yeah. about the attachments that children have with pets absolutely and I know Merlin your beautiful black cat is very much someone in your home who really mattered to you so who would ever have thought that a hamster could actually make somebody think of their cat but indeed Michelle and Kate were bang on it absolutely exactly every every kid can connect to a book if if they have the right little things there yes and isn't that it? That's for me why I think there are the connections. How has this book in fictional Aberglynn reached children in New Zealand or inner city London? Because there's connections of pets or other children or the school. There is something there that can be related to. Yeah. I'm sure, Jenny, the folks on screen, those who have had the privilege to listened to you before or are new and knowing that you were somebody who had fire safety sessions because you were setting fires I think they'd really value your perspectives on this work more generally about here we are these big adults who know best to look after you fix you god forbid would there be anything you'd say to us on screen from schools from fire services across continents that you think do you know what when you do this work have a think about this hmm. um definitely focus on the relationship first always that's i've been preaching that you know since i started working with joanna and my work now with in social care i always constantly preach make that connection with um the child first and this book perfect for that because it's it's easy it go straight into it it's not one-on-one -on -one, it's actually that sort of mediator between the two so focus on the relationship first and then start teaching I think um obviously you want to focus on the teaching from the very beginning but you know I would definitely suggest this book first thing um and I think with there's so many kids that people work with the diversity of the book is also very important and I, I actually really enjoyed the diversity of it like you see the um mixed race girl I think it was with the pigtails yes. I spotted her instantly um I think that's always so important to kind of remember to have that sort of diversity sort of dynamic um and obviously eight years later this book's still important to me so overall the book's amazing I love it <laughs> um, but that's the message I would I would definitely start with is always start on the relationship first don't go straight into you know fire's bad I think easing into it, just like the book does, is very important. And in many ways, you echoed what you found in the book, connections. Yeah. So the book can connect and allows connections to form, to relationships, for relationships, sorry, to be happening and to be healthy. And there's been a, a, a happy shift, thank goodness, from where it used to be very much, don't attach to children, don't attach to children you work with, boundaries, boundaries, boundaries. And of course, we are always boundaried. We are there in a role to make sure you are all right. It's you and your needs. Yeah. But of course we attach. And how do we have safe attachments? It's by sharing, it's by reading, it's by connecting, it's showing an interest rather than straight in for the, we've got a big important job to do and you're gonna listen. And I'm not saying people consciously do that, but it can be enormous pressure for us on us professionals to think I need to try and make this child and family safe so I got to get in there right use my hour and I'm going to give every fire safety message but actually nothing can happen without the thread of a relationship and I think you've reminded us of that really powerfully and really importantly yeah well I can't remember her name I'm so sorry uh she before was telling the story about the uh child from hell I think yes yes that was Diana talking yeah. about yes the son of Satan son of Satan six-year-old boy exactly it's just I don't even get me started when when I heard that I instantly was like ah oh. but it, 
you can clearly tell that relationship around him was not good. So the relationship with him and her was incredibly important and that's going to make a huge difference like how it did with you and me that's going to make a huge difference in the later years so that's why i say relationships now especially when they're young that's going to have the biggest impact on them and they'll remember that and they'll carry that with them you know just as much as the teachings you know the teachings will have a bigger effect if the relationship is strong yes so. Yes, and you make me think very much of the poet Maya Angelou, who I know we've talked about before, where she says, and I paraphrase badly, but we will forget what people say, but we never forget how they made us feel. Yeah. And I think that's very much what Diana was able to show us so powerfully, that this boy could feel that this woman, as professional as she will always be, allowed him to know no she sees me not the label not this naughty child but a six-year-old who of course can read and enjoy a story and again you've highlighted for us Jenny the importance that when it made you do that to hear a child described in that way how do we speak about each other and the children families we work with what about those hard to reach children? Well, are they just easy to ignore and we are hard to reach? How do we make ourselves accessible? And the work that Mel is doing, right? I'll be accessible through a screen and also face to face. Excellent. Yeah. I'm going to open up to questions generally from the floor, but Jenny, is there anything you'd like to say to finish? No, no, I'm <laughs> Say that again, sorry. I'm, in, I'm enjoying this meeting. I'm learning a lot. That's <laughs> so, good. Good. What are you learning? Well, I was learning about, obviously, how the book was made. Amazing. Um, <laughs> the importance of not judging a book by the cover um, and online teaching. I, I was dreading online teaching at uni, but to hear how it, how it was working and how to do it and all that sort of stuff. I like that. It was really interesting. Um, someone said it earlier, but I, for the life of me, I can't remember. If I remember, it, I'll come back on and just, you know, shout it out. But okay. uh, someone said something really important that's just completely slipped my mind. But that um, I'm listening and I'm picking up on a lot of stuff. <laughs> clearly, clearly, the fact you were referencing back to the different folks who have spoken. It's hard to remember people's names when you're also thinking about, oh, I'm next, I'm next, what am I going to say? And my <laughs> apologies that my long question at the start made you go, what? Yeah. There's a lesson in the importance of communication, Joanna Foster. <laughs> so thank you for your patience and bearing with me. So thank you, Jenny. Uh, like all the other speakers so far, isn't this a privilege? What a joyful way to spend a few hours at work. So folks, as I said, over to you. Let me check the time. We've got roughly 10 minutes for any questions that people would like to ask of the people you've heard from today. Jenny, Michelle, Kate, Melanie, Diana, Charlie, we are here for your reflections, your questions. Can I say something, Joanna? Because we did talk about uh, earlier on, um, but I think a couple of other people might appreciate because they, they weren't on, but we were talking about a page turner that was available online a little while ago, which is a really good resource. And I think Kate was saying that she she might know where it is in the deep dark depths of somewhere. It would be really good to have that page turner available again, because that would certainly be better than the pictures that I've got um, <laughs> on my PowerPoint. It, it would it would fit in with with it would make it work even better than it already does. So if we could ever find that, that would be brilliant. Yes, so those of us who came on screen a little before half past 10 were chatting and Melly raised the important question of, there used to be, a, yeah, a page turner e-version of Jez. It was on the original Staywise 2 website, which we know was removed and later is now relaunched as Staywise, a resource platform for different emergency service workers and professionals and even parents. And where has Jez gone in the e-world? But we have discovered that Kate seems to have squirreled away on a DVD or CD, that's how old we are, that we might just have that e version of it. And it's fabulous because, yes, the pages turn, 
but also the hamster is there with binoculars that you can zoom in on different parts of the book. So Kate and Michelle, just we thought we could maybe relax a little. We've got the second edition out. We've got another to do on our job list. So Melanie, leave that with us to think about how we get Jez back in the E world. But yes, isn't it extraordinary that our resources almost go missing and then, I think it's marvellous what you've done to <laughs> that dedication you talked about, standing on a stool or chair, hovering about to get the kitchen from hell in and put that into a PowerPoint. That takes time and dedication and your children. And we know our young people are in worlds of Apple and technology we can only dream of with our budgets. Yet what they will have, which they won't get through their other screens, potentially, is somebody who tottered on the edge of a chair to bring a book to life for them. And then it comes through in how you look at them and how you speak with them and how you type up their conversation. So don't be too hard on yourself with the do it yourself PowerPoint because it's working. But yes, we will think about how to get that e-version tracked down and accessible. So let me just ch check the chat box. Ah, so yes, Yasmin Ellis of Dorset and Wiltshire Fire and Rescue Service. What a pleasure to listen to all the speakers. Here, here. Where can we order this lovely book? So that will be at the end. So I'm going to keep on a EastEnders drum roll cliffhanger, just like the hamster. Will Jez do it? Will he not? So that's coming, Yasmin. But thank you that I ensure I don't forget. And Kate has put in, now this is where Kate propels me into the 2021 20, that we live in. Maybe you could mention the augmented reality opportunities being developed. So when Kate first mentioned this to me and Michelle, me and Michelle were like, well, so in the new edition is a zapper code. At the back page, there is a zapper code and you can use a phone to do something. Actually, Kate, you describe it. You do it better than me because you know what you're talking about. But she's getting there as whiz bang and into the 21st century. So, uh, Kate, take it away. Um, yes. Um Augmented reality is something that I've been working with a lot in my job, uh, my day job. Um, and it's a way of using, um, a, it's like a QR code, it's like a portal to something else. And um, we're obviously, I'm going to have a look and see if I can find our page turning hamster, but it may be that we can put something else into this zapper code so that. Um, you have those resources that you need with the, um, for example, just the images so that you could use the images while you're talking about the book. Um, so augmented reality, all it is, is we, we use Zappa because it's a very user friendly one for educational resources. Um, and we have a license for that where I work. It's also free to download. And that's really, really important because people can't be bothered, you know, be asked to um, you know, spend more money to, to download something. So it's a free downloadable uh, um, app called Zappar, Z-A-P-P-A-R. And all you need to do, once you've got this on your phone um, or, or your um, tablet, it works on phones, smartphones and tablets, you just hover over the image, just like you would with a QR code. The first time you do it, you need Wi-Fi. I need to be connected to Wi-Fi or on your phone with your 4G or whatever. And it takes a couple of seconds to unlock the image. But the good thing is, is once you've done it once on your phone or device, it remembers it without Wi-Fi. It will always oh. recognize that image. And it can take you into all sorts of other things. For example, you can lead into a video, it could lead into a website, it could lead into an animation. So there's all sorts of things. So it's another way of, of, of uh, using it. Now, we're just exploring this at the moment. And so when you get your copies of the book and try it, um, you might find a holding thing at the moment, which is likely to be um, Joanna reading the book. <laughs> the ones that we've, because we've already got that, we'll just, stick that into the it, for, for the time being but it does give us that opportunity of um changing what we put in there as well because of course it's uh, although we have to put the uh, code on when it go, comes to printing the book we can change what's in that code so we can update it we could put notes in if we wanted to or um links to other things that have been developed that because joanna's got 
millions of ideas here. So it's just another thing of, of, of using uh, digital media um, and technology to uh, do something else. And this is where it's been a joy to work with. <laughs> Um, Michelle and Kate, because I've learned so much. And um, seriously, I'm a little bit more advanced than the hairdryer scenario of technology than Michelle, but not that much further. So, yes, in the back cover of the new edition will be the Zapper code, very much like a QR code. Thank you, Kate. And yes, you can use that to look for updated material. The book will stay static, of course, the hard copy, but we will update with different additional resources, the Zappa code, and certainly, Melly, you've raised a really important consideration for us of, yes, getting that e-version of the book available. And of course, what Kate and Michelle are evidencing here, and it's not always common, equally the uh, the publishers, Petra Publishing, have allowed is, of course, when you get the book, there are the usual copyright considerations. This is Michelle and Kate's work and Jason's work. But they have very graciously said that if it's not for the purposes of profit, that you're not selling the book as your own, you can indeed do as Melanie did and photograph it and put it into a PowerPoint. So then you've got it, which is a generosity, which basically sums up these two wonderful women and their warmth and creativity. And um, question has come into the chat box, an important one. So I want to pick this up from Danny Hall of Cheshire Fine Rescue Service, who says, I'm just wondering what has been the highest age range practitioners have used this book in? I am working with a young person in care with special educational needs and was wondering if using the book might break the ice a bit. He is 14, probably sits around 12 in terms of his range of understanding, but I'm feeling it might still be a bit young for him. Cracking question. So uh, Charlie spoke about using Jez with a 14 year old. My oldest experience is with a 13 year old who was Jenny, who we've heard from. What I think is crucial here, Danny, is so he's a child in care. So we take it that his history comes with historical and current trauma. So you also know he has special education needs. So of course, find out more about that and meet him at his emotional needs, which is likely to be a lot younger. But a good way to broach the subject, because even if he's 14 and understands the world emotionally, or intellectually at a younger age, we're never here to patronise anyone. And if you rock up for the first time with this big book, then we may be in the territory of someone turning around and saying to you, what do you think I am, stupid? So how I introduced it with Jenny was after a few sessions in, I knew Jenny loved reading and she brought a copy of her favourite book. And I said, there's a book I really love that I'd like to share with you next time, but it's really for younger children. So it's uh, way, way easy. It's you're used to you reading much older, intelligent books, as it were. But I think you'd really like it. Would you let me bring it and read it together? And so I really acknowledge, look, this is younger. You're probably going to think, what's this? but I think you really like it because I love it. What do you think? Can I bring it? Would it be all right to read it together? And notice what I've done there is I'm asking, can I bring it? Would you let me? I love it. So if as an older, much, much older adult, I'm all right for saying it's one of my favourite books, then that's what I would think about there, Danny. How do you make this okay for someone to enjoy, and I'm sure they will, for all the reasons that Jenny said and Charlie said about her case. So be at ease with the suggestion of it and that it's about, I love this book, what do you think? Can I read it? And taking it from there. Other people's thoughts or Danny's reflections back? Can I just say something? Of course, Melanie. Um, the other way, we we have done we've sort of broke that kind of thing before is to say to the to the young person that it's a book that you'd like to read with some younger people it's quite a new book to you and ask them to 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 go through it with you with the view of you sharing it with younger children just oh. to 
thoughts on it and they're still they're still reading that book and getting those messages but you're not reading it to them you just want them to help you with some ideas for some younger children genius absolutely genius how inclusive is that you want their opinion you can just imagine wherever the teenager is growing that hey someone from the fire service wants my opinion about a book that they want to use for younger children sensational so there's a couple of ideas there danny on how to broach it anything danny to come back with no, I think that's that's really um, some good ideas. I like Melanie's um, yeah. Melanie's little um, take on it there because I think that that would really work with him. Um, I know this um, young person does come from quite a difficult um, background, so it's just really about you know tying in with what Jenny was saying before about building that relationship yes. and sort of not presenting as the authoritarian. I'm going to tell you off about this sort of thing, yes. which is really, really important to me to maintain. Um, so that's a really, really nice way of doing it because it's completely non-threatening. It's not belittling in any way, shape or form. And it just allows us to spend that time together, getting some messages in without it being anything that I'm actually like formally teaching. Although we all know that I will be, but you know, exactly. it kind of slips it under exactly. the radar there. So I like that. Thanks, Melanie. Yes, I'll, I'll take that one is. forward. It is superb. And Kate in the chat box put a very nice uh, additional thought is actually the level of detail in the background our older readers will really pick up on, especially if we've now set this task almost and look at it through your eyes. Tell me what you think it might be like for younger children. So superb. Doesn't it just show like these two hours have that great things can happen? when good people start talking. What a joy of two hours to spend in your company. And so we career towards the end of our two hours. Of course, yes, I need to let you know where indeed do you get the book. So I'm enormously proud to be the sole distributor for the book. So you can purchase the book by contacting me through my email address of info at fabtic.co.uk. The cover price of the book is £18 and if you live in Wales, England and Scotland that will include postage and packaging other territories, jurisdictions, there will need to be the charge for postage and packaging, but that's physically how you can order your book. And there's two options with ordering. As I've said, I've given you the cover price, you can order it individually or five copies, 10 copies, 20, however many you need in your workplace, or they come as part of a suite of resources in the resource packs I produce for practitioners. And those of you that have used the packs before will know those resources go from toddlers through to teenagers. So if you ever ordered a Fabtic resource pack, you'll find Jez included in the range of books and other hands-on activities. And again, to find out more about the resource packs, it's the same email address, info at fabtic.co.uk. And so I think it's only right that I should really let Michelle and Kate have the last words. They might now look at me in horror going, that wasn't in the script. We never talked about that before, Foster. But it would just be remiss that I don't go back to you and say, Michelle and Kate, thank you for the joy you brought to so many children alongside Jason with the immense, epic, Taylor is Jez's lucky day. Anything you'd like to say before we go back to the real world of work? I think I'm immensely glad that we didn't decide to call it the big red book that will stop children setting fires. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lot of conversations, Michelle and I, about what we would call this book and why it turned out as Jez's lucky day. The first thing is that the name Jez, um, Michelle was very insistent. She said, we must have something that sounds like a nickname mm. that um, any child from any background or gender could identify with. We want a Z and an apostrophe because it's really hard. 
<laughs> for the literacy elements. So that's so jazz. And um, so we knew it had to have this, this jazz in the title. But it was about halfway through when we were doing this that we realized that there was this thing about what is luck? And what mm -hmm. do we think? And you they absolutely picked up by uh, others who, who said about how they've talk, started talking about, uh, Melanie was saying about what sort of, well, what's your lucky day look like? And um, of course, the biggest luck that Jez has is that they all survived and including the hamster, of course. Um, but we, that's not how he thought of a lucky day. And it's, yeah. it's, a, it's an ordinary day for Jez with lots of nice things that happen, but an extraordinarily lucky thing at the end that he doesn't die. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then he, he has another chance to get it right on another, on another occasion. So Jez's lucky day, I'm so glad that we chose that title. and. Uh, it's something that you, 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 I think, is one of those points where children can engage with it because they want to know what was lucky. Brilliant, brilliant, Kate. Thank you very much. And have they really enjoyed this morning listening to everybody, how people are using the book? Because for a long while, this book went into a black hole and we had no idea. We, we worked very, very hard. Every word in that um, was discussed. There's, there's no spare words there. In fact, Joanna, I think, has been <laughs> really surprised to find out how geeky we were about what uh, the detail that we... It matters. It every matters. Word, well, every word did matter, but then it sort of got lost until we were just amazed and fortunate to meet Joanna, who had heard of the book. Um, what would you say about that, Michelle? Thank you, Kate. Michelle, the final words to take us into the finish. I just think it's been an absolute joy to hear everybody else's story yeah. because we write it, you know, we put it out there and as Kate said, it was forgotten about and stored in a cupboard. And then we had our own lucky day twice when um, the council were clearing out a cupboard to move to new premises and a young woman was asked to empty a cupboard and she opened the cupboard door and all these red books fell out. And she was one of the children we trialled it with, and she was then grown up and working in the council offices. And no. she got a slightly unusual name, and she thought, oh my God, it's her. And she knew where I was working, and she rang me and said, I, I'm supposed to take these to the dump, but I can't. <gasps> can I drop them round to you? And she did. And then shortly after, we had a letter from the council saying, there's a woman trying to get hold of you. <laughs> <laughs> we know who still works around here and we had no idea you know that you pitched up as well so kate and i feel that we've had mm. our lucky days by by joanna giving jez and his hamster a whole new lease of life that and to hear how it's unfolded i was saying to joanna before we started we all work with young people and kids and teenagers and all sorts and we're we're part of their lives for just a short time really um and then you you do your best you put something in there you hope that something will stick, as, as uh, Jenny so aptly put it. And then I said to Joanna, it's like leaving a film 10 minutes before the end. You never really know how it's going to pan out. And to hear Jenny speaking about how it panned out for her, to hear that Jez is now going on to do it again, it, I feel like I've got my 10 minutes back. So I've had a yeah. little... I'm so Zoom phobic. You have no idea. I've been sleeping. <laughs> I hate all this, but I've absolutely adored this. So thank you so much to everybody. Yeah. It's really made my year. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. You can see in the chat box, there's loads of things coming through. There's so much to look at and talk about. And thank you. And people love the book. So yes. The journey of Jez carries on. And so folks, as sad though it is to bring it to a close, we need to think of the time. So thank you everyone for coming, whether you've spoken, whether you've listened, whether you were hovering, waiting to translate. It's been enriching and moving and an inspiring and joyful two hours. And so Dioch and Vauriaun, thank you very much. And Hoilvaur, Chirio. Hold out.